It's a positive film. It has heroes and villains, and uh, that it essentially uh, is a fun movie to watch. It's been a long time since people have been able to go to the movies and see a sort of straightforward, wholesome, fun adventure. Well, it's a fantasy. It's not science fiction so much as it is space fantasy. And it's about people. It's about... Fin it's finally about people and not finally about science. The story, when you actually put it into words, is only so much nonsense to hang a great visual experience onto. It's the stuff that fairy tales are made of sort of boiling down religion into a very basic concept. Uh, the fact that there is some deity or some power or some force that sort of controls our destiny uh, works for good and also works for evil. Marvelous, healthy innocence. Great place, wonderful to look at, full of guts, nothing unpleasant. I mean, people go bang, bang, and people fall over and dead. But, you know, no horrors. A sort of wonderful freshness about it, a kind of like a wonderful fresh air. It's got whatever you want it to be. It's a it's pure entertainment. It's like a roller coaster ride, and it can be interpreted as long as you enjoy it, which is the intention. Hello, welcome back to Generation Skywalker and welcome back to Book Month. I'm with Dan. Good evening, Dan. Good evening. J just the two of us, Dan. We are doing an interview with uh, quite a special guest. We've got Steve Sansweet joining us very, very shortly. Very exciting. I know, Dan, that you are a big Sansweet fan, like I am. I've, I think I've got the majority of the books on his list. Any area you would like to discuss mainly with him tonight? I think, well, we, we already know the two main books, but anything else around the scrapbook would be good to get some insight in that. And, yeah, just what he's up to now, really. And Indeed. if he's got any future plans. So, yeah, I bet it'd be good. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, right. So let's see if we can dial him in. Good evening, Steve. Hi, guys. How are you? We're all good. Strange year, Steve pandemic um how has everything been has rancho obi-wan survived all right things are a little tough um we've uh, had to close the museum for tours since uh march and it's not clear when we're going to be open um because california still is in the throes of the pandemic and the way we do tours we usually have groups of uh 10 to 12 led by either me or one of our docents and the tours take two to three hours and Rancho is big for a Star Wars museum, 9,000 square feet, but it's not the kind of tour where we can space people six feet apart. So um, we have rushed to put something together that we've been planning to do for many years and just had not got it around to, which is our virtual museum. And so this is a way to become part of Rancho Obi-Wan in addition to becoming a uh, subscriber to Rancho Obi-Wan, which gets you a nice annual kit and patch and little pin uh, after you're a member for a year. The um, virtual museum is a way to see videos specially done for subscribers. We have five different levels of subscribing. We have photos, we have blogs, um, we have me talking about my career, um, if anybody's interested and uh, talking about books, going into the library, uh, doing all sorts of behind the scenes things. We've got, um, we learn all about Rancho Obi-Wan, the collectibles, some of the past events that we've done. And we're talking about, since we couldn't have our big fundraising gala this year, we're talking about doing hopefully some sort of virtual gala later this year. I suppose that's the problem, isn't it, Steve, with when you're funded as you are and reliant so heavily on on those kind of things so where can people find out how to how to get involved in the virtual tours is that over on the rancho obi-wan site right you can go to rancho obi-wan.org and um, both subscribe donate or become a member of the virtual museum we also have a rancho obi-wan facebook page that we try to update daily with uh 
new items from the Rancho Museum and uh, just have some fun with that. So we've got a lot of followers on that. And we also have news about Rancher that we post on there, too. Lovely, lovely stuff. So we do urge everybody to go and check that out. Steve, so we've got you on to to discuss your books. I've, I've written down a list of all your of all your Star Wars books, but it then came up that I'd, I'd never I've never seen these before. But you you had two very early books, didn't you? Something called Punishment Cure and a 1980s book called Science Fiction Toys and Models. What are those books? Because they 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 come out a lot earlier than your Star Wars stuff. Well, the Punishment Cure, I never, I always wanted to write a book, and um, sometimes you never think you have the chance. So I was a reporter at the Wall Street Journal at the time, a place where I was for 26 years. I was a reporter, and then later I ended my career there as bureau chief in the Los Angeles bureau for nine years. And uh, I had written a front page story about aversive conditioning, aversion therapy, which was big back in the late 60s and the 70s. And it was really using things like um, nausea inducing drugs and um, electric shock and mild electric shock and things like that to stop people from smoking and drinking and they were trying to use it on people who didn't want to be gay anymore. I um, mean, it was quite a disgusting <laughs> situation. And I mean, there were for profit clinics that had been set up to do these things. Uh, there was something called the Schick Shadell Clinics for uh, smoking control. And this was a growing phenomenon, at least in the United States. And so I wrote this front page story that was a sort of a semi-skeptical look at aversion therapy. And I got a phone call from a uh, book publisher in New York and said, would you like to do a book on this subject? And I thought, well, not really, but it's the one chance I may have to ever write a book. And so I agreed to do it. And that publisher went out of business, but they passed the manuscript on to a different publisher. And then that book uh, came out in a fairly small print edition. And um, I had a friend at the journal said, oh, yeah, I just found it. It's on the remainder table at uh, Barnes and Noble. (laughs) (laughs) So uh, that didn't make a big splash, but uh, it was a way to have a book out. Little did I know that there would be a couple of books more in my future. The science fiction Toys and Models was more of a soft cover, um, probably a 30 or 40 page uh, soft cover book that was published by Starlog Magazine, one of the pioneers of uh, science fiction magazines in the 70s. And um, I got together with a friend of mine, Bob Burns, who has an amazing collection of science fiction toys and props and things like that. And uh, we did this um, basically a photo book of some of these amazing toys from the 50s through Star Wars toys and uh, wrote extensive captions and the little introductions. Um, So those those were the two books or a book and a bookette, I guess, before Star Wars came along. Steve, t- two of the two of the books I think had some of the biggest impact on Star Wars was from Concept to Screen to Collectible and the Tomart's Price Guide. Before we get to that, so you've just said you you work for the Wall Street Journal. You then become the director of content management and head of fans relations at Lucasfilm. Is that correct? Right. How do you get a gig like that? Well. The books sort of uh, led into that because I was writing the books while I was still at the Wall Street Journal, the first couple of books. And so maybe we should talk about the books first and how they led into the job. Okay, fair fair enough then. Yes. So I've interviewed over the last six, seven years, I've interviewed an awful lot of Star Wars collectors and especially a certain old school star kind of collector. When you ask them what got them into it, it's this book. Some of them weren't even, collecting wasn't even on their radar. And then they've come across this book in bookshops and it's just changed everything. That They've picked it up and there's things in there that are that they've never seen before. You know, people say, I've never seen the blue snag before. Or uh, I know one of one of the my friends in over here in the UK uh, had never seen the Tonton teapot, for example. And uh, it just spiked their interest and they then got into collecting. 
did you realize that 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 kind of book would have such an impact on a hobby? I really didn't. Um, it's funny the way that book came about. I was uh, I, I heard through the grapevine and there was quite a grapevine going on. There was not much in the way of Star Wars news or projects in development that we knew about in the uh in the late 80s or early 90s, but I heard through the grapevine that Lucasfilm had restarted its publishing division and was thinking about doing a Star Wars price guide, an official Star Wars price guide. I found out who the head of the publishing division was, and basically I cold called them and said, if anybody does the Star Wars price guide, it should be me, and basically got the answer. And, and you are who? <laughs> and I proceeded to tell them that I had a large collection and that I was a writer and I worked for the Wall Street Journal. So all of this was uh, was helping my case. But they had already talked to Tomart about the price guide. Um, and then I was discussing this was with a woman named Lucy Wilson. I was discussing the book with her and she said, well, what I really want is a price guide with some anecdotes. And I said, well, that's really a different sort of book. You can't really do a price guide and have stories, too. It just it confuses the issue. The price guide is going to be uh, big enough and complex enough on its own. I said, it sounds like you want a an anecdotal book about items and collectibles, but in a different sort of way. And so we came up with this idea of doing something that took Star Wars from an idea in George Lucas's mind to how it was turned into a reality by Lucasfilm and Industrial Light and Magic, and then how that led to the merchandise. And, um, of course, uh, the, the famous story of, of George taking less money to direct Star Wars, but in order to get the rights after Star Wars to do the merchandise and license the merchandise himself and, to, and do all the approvals on it. And uh, but basically that enabled him to make the rest of the Star Wars movies on his own and become an independent filmmaker. So the merchandise played a huge role in this whole thing that we know of in the last 40 plus years as the Star Wars saga. And, uh, you know, eventually led to the sale of Lucasfilm to Disney. And so I started out interviewing George Lucas for, he gave me a, like a two and a half hour interview uh, at Skywalker Ranch. And uh, then talked to people at Industrial Light and Magic. And got some great anecdotes, did a lot of research. Uh, and then went to Cincinnati and talked to the... Kenner Products people who had then had recently been bought up by Hasbro, but were still in Cincinnati. They hadn't moved them yet to uh, Rhode Island and um, just got wonderful anecdotes and photos. And, you know, nobody had really done a history of all of this great stuff before and put it together in one volume and all kinds of great pictures. A friend of mine who was a professional photographer took a lot of the photos that we didn't get from the sources themselves and things like uh, prototypes and odd things that people had never seen before. And people started telling me years later that they found the book. It was the first thing they found and that they became infatuated with this and became collectors themselves because here we have a bunch of people mainly guys but some women too who had who were kids when star wars came out and now had some disposable income and went back to recreate the feel and the the memories and the nostalgia that they had with star wars and star wars collectibles some people blame me of course especially spouses but uh I take I take the criticism along with the uh, approbation. So, <laughs> what was it like? Was that the first time you met George Lucas when you'd interviewed him? It was the first time I had met him in a business setting. I had gotten an autograph from him at the opening of uh, the uh, Michael Jackson Captain EO uh, <laughs> film at uh, Disneyland. So, uh, you know. I was hoping he, I sort of interrupted a, 
a, a little chat session that he was having and so he was very kind and signed my book and uh i was hoping he wouldn't recognize me because it had been several years before and i also talked to him on the phone in 1987 and i was doing a uh, column for the wall street journal on the 10th anniversary of star wars and what made it such a uh, cultural uh, landmark and and that had continued with fandom even though there were no new movies and no promise of new movies or projects at that point. With the images, when you say, uh, you know, you obviously saw some of the photography from people, did you get a lot from the Kenner archives with regards to images? And did you have full access to that kind of area? The Kenner, ar- the Kenner archives were ba- was basically non-existent. They didn't even have uh, a full set of their own uh, Toy Fair International catalogs. You know, the, they... Back in the day, they put out these color catalogs for toy store owners when there were many more independent toy stores in the, the U.S. and uh, uh, Canada. And twice a year, there would be these major catalogs that would come out. And um, again, they did not have a full set. I had more toy catalogs than they did, Kenner toy catalogs. And their files of photos were, you know, pretty bare, too. I found out years later that a lot of the photo material existed at the uh, outside photography studio um, that uh, that was in Cincinnati that that did the uh, the shoots. There's a guy named Kim Simmons, the man who shot Luke Skywalker, yeah. who's uh, done one book and is uh, is almost finished a second book about the uh, the first book was on Star Wars toy photography. And the second book was on uh, Empire Strikes Back, uh, the Empire Strikes Back toy photography. And um, he bought the uh, studio from um, his then boss. And so he did. He started doing the actual photography on Empire. Um, but those things were not apparent to me at the time. I had a lot of this stuff in my own collection. And then Mark Boudreau, who was the longtime Kenner designer, who was there in 1977 and just retired this year, Mark had some images in his own personal collection. He brought in um, other things that uh, Kenner provided photos of, like the rocket-firing Boba Fett and uh, and other prototypes. Uh, we got some uh, some uh, architectural drawings from them of the toys you know the uh the blue lines and uh, so between between that and mark's help and getting uh items rare items from my collection as well as the common items um we managed to put together a pretty good uh pretty good book and a lot of the prototypes you would that are in the book were you seeing some of those for the first time and if so how exciting was it to see yeah it was pretty cool but um if i if i knew then what i know now um (laughs) i would have gone i mean i would see prototypes in the offices of uh a couple of the designers and some of the the people who had worked on them like the star tots which turned out to be one of my favorite items so were not produced these were miniature almost lego like figures and the size and and a snow speeder and a land speeder and a um an x-wing and i just you know saw so much stuff around the office at kenner that was that was very cool they were excited because here was somebody interested in writing about their star wars success and w- which had really you know sort of calmed down because there were no new star wars toys in the market so they were willing to show me all kinds of things and some people brought in things from their own collection and if i had only said uh would like to sell any of that stuff but i did <laughs> i mean i was still working at the journal and i still had the um the mindset of a uh, of a journal reporter and that was uh, you 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 didn't mix business and pleasure now people who got the book quickly went to cincinnati and got uh, all kinds of uh, uh uh directories of kenner people from the, from the years back and searched phone books and i mean there was a gang of guys who just did this amazing job and 
just went all through Cincinnati looking for some of these rare prototypes and uh, toys and schematics and just did a fantastic job for the hobby and coming up with things and and have followed up with all sorts of uh, histories. The Star Wars Collector Archive, which used to be called Toys or Gus, yeah. uh, that Gus Lopez put together, you know, is a is a fount of information on on Star Wars toy history. And so people followed up with the book and got into it in much more depth. Um, this book was uh, meant for the general market and um, it did quite well. And so I was very pleased with the, both the reception to it, the design of it, the uh, head of Chronicle Books, the then new editor-in-chief of Chronicle Books took personal care with this and he was the he was the line editor on the book a guy named Nyan McAvoy and uh, his family owned Chronicle Books and the San Francisco Chronicle and TV and radio stations but uh, it, it was his sort of inauguration into the business and I met him and you know it was it was just great and he was you know, very, very much interested in making this the best book possible. Found two great designers, and um, we did the paid for the photography, and so uh, it was a wonderful experience all around. I must admit, you you say it's well received. I, I've bought over the years lots and lots of uh, job lots of toys. The amount of times I go and pick up a job lot and pick up someone's collection and, and this book is in that in that collection. It just goes to show that how many people were, were lucky enough to actually source it and uh, use it as a reference guide because it is such such a beautiful book. Even now, it stands the test of time. I, I had a couple of hours this afternoon just going back through it and it's still so beautiful to look through. Now that yeah. book came out in 1992. Yeah, so 28 so, years ago and it's still... yeah. Still there. What I do love about it is the anecdotes, and uh, you've got all these things. I think they're called factoids in there, and right. these little stories. And uh, there's there's so many great little stories. Things like I'm a massive Neil Young fan, and I saw that story um, again today about him having a couple of jowers on on stage with him and whatnot. And um, when I was reading it, I thought to myself, well, this is the stuff that's made it. You you must have had an awful lot more which didn't make the book. There was uh, there was a lot of stuff. I had gone through the Lucasfilm files, and they had um, they had just recently disposed of files from licensing, unfortunately, but they still had the contractual files, and they still had catalogs from a lot of the companies in the contractual files. So I spent um, I spent a couple of weeks uh, camped out at Lucasfilm just spending all day and into the early evening going through file after file after file. And that's where I got so many of the wonderful anecdotes, like the Neil Young anecdote about the Jawas and um, the, the, the U S government questioning whether, you know, they could do an X wing fighter or whether there was a security issue with it. It was, you know, just weird stuff. It just, uh, and that's that's when the factoids came about because they didn't fit into the general text so much, but um, they were fun little placeholders to put, and it worked for both the, the look of the book and also the added fun for uh, for the little factoids. There's there's so many stories in there which I'm aware of. They're kind of in in the back of my mind, and uh, you you know a, a lot of collectors will know them, and you talk to people and you relay these stories, but. In hindsight, this is probably where they initially came from, isn't it? This is the first real source of that kind of information. I find a, I find a lot of stuff that uh, that I see even these days that, based on information and quotes that I initially came up with, I just saw something today about the uh, uh, a story that came out today, and I forget what it was about, but it, it, it mentioned the Star Wars Holiday Special, um, the uh, the awful tv show that the only thing worth talking about is the 10 minute uh, boba fett the animated uh, section i once i once discussed it with george and he said if he could but back then there were only vhs vhs tapes of it going circulating in the bootleg market and he said if he could 
if he could go around the world and find every one of those VHS tapes, he would personally smash them with a sledgehammer. So, um, <laughs> and there was this quote that was in this story, you know, that said, George Lucas says that he would <laughs> smash all copies with a sledgehammer if he could. Yeah, and that's a, that's a quote that I got from him 30 years ago. But now there, there is a there is a bit of nostalgia about it now and a bit of enjoyment from it, isn't it? I know, I think it was, was it in your vaults that you put the music from um, Life Day? Yes, included? Carrie Fisher's uh Carrie Fisher's song. I remember having to call Carrie Fisher and asking her whether um, I could get her permission to uh, use the song. <laughs> <laughs> what was her response to that? <laughs> oh, I don't care. <laughs> that that awful thing? Are you kidding? I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can just uh, imagine her saying that. Uh, yeah. Just getting back to the concept, just for a, a couple of minutes. Now, when you released this book, we said '92 earlier. There'd obviously been a, a quite a dark dark patch with no star wars in it right. for a few years and um we actually i actually spoke with a couple of other people the other night that uh, air to the empire had come out in 91 and was the first star wars book back at that po- time right it did it, it did outstandingly well surprised everyone went shot to number one on the new york times bestseller list that's right so this is probably the next book that's out after that yeah yes so the, the cover, the first one, new nonfiction book. The cover is really iconic, isn't it? But there's no writing on it or anything. So was that ever a gamble? What what was the thinking behind the cover? Well, that was that was really interesting. I mean, they were asking me for a cover image, and I came up with the we came up with the gold uh, Darth Vader case, and um, and then I I submitted that as a, as a possible iconic cover and then the designers who were just really sharp sold the publisher on the idea of doing it as a four section photo and black and gold and then the idea of not putting the title on the cover just shows how iconic the image of Darth Vader was and um, I thought that was a pretty bold move but they realized that most books are shelved in bookstores with the spine out and even if the cover was put out, it would attract people because they would say, well, whoa, what's this? And uh, and it did. It worked very well. One of the few books I've ever seen that doesn't have a title or any any writing on the cover. Yeah. No. And, it, and it's so iconic, isn't it? I, I own a lot of Star Wars books. And if you ask me what was on the cover, I probably couldn't name many of them. But right. but that one straight away. Yeah. You're saying about the spine as well now. The, t- the title was quite a long title, wasn't it, for a book? From concept to screen to collectible. Was any other options out oh, there for that? God, yeah, there were all kinds of ideas. I mean, we we try to shorten it, but um, to really say what was in the book and give an idea, especially because Star Wars publishing was so new again, we decided to go with the with the long title. I can't remember some of the other ones, but there were all kinds of, you know... Star Wars, a uh, I don't even remember. I couldn't even hazard a, hazard a guess. It does what it says on the tin, though. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it's exactly, it describes exactly what the book is, doesn't it? And um, yeah, it's uh, still very fond fondly uh, placed in my library. So that leads us on to the Tome Arts Guide, the pri- the price guide, which I think was released in 1994, if memory serves. Right, the first one in '94, and then the. Uh, yeah. Second edition in 96 or 97, yeah. 96, I think. So uh, the Tomar Price Guide was uh, was a matter of working with uh, Tom Tumbush. In, um, he was in Cincinnati, too, and published uh, um, magazines, um, Disney Anna magazines, and then action figure magazines. He published Action Figure Digest. He had gotten the... the uh, rights from Lucasfilm to do a Star Wars price guide and this Lucy Wilson, the head of publishing, said that she wanted me to work with Tom and his son Tien Tumbush to do the price guide. And so we separated the the work on that. They were responsible because they were really in touch with the whole Kenner subculture and the action figures and um, 
all the toys and things. So they were responsible for the toy section, and I was responsible for everything else. And I was still living in Los Angeles at the time and had added two levels onto my house. I had a uh, a house that was on stilts in the Hollywood Hills and uh, first added a second story underneath and then a third story. And the third story contained all the Star Wars stuff. Second story had my office and my space toy collection, which was rockets and robots and Flash Gordon and Major Matt Mason and you name it. Because through the early 90s, I had two separate collections and then Star Wars just completely took over. But uh, I would go down into the Star Wars level. And, for example, if the if the uh, category was... Um, home items i would get all the sheets and the towels and the pillowcases and i would just get giant handfuls of things and bring them upstairs to my office and just start typing and um so basically the first especially the first tomark guide is a uh, is a collection is based on my personal collection as are many of the photos a lot of the foreign items we got from the again the um, the material they had in the in the um, contract files at Lucasfilm that I had already gone through uh, for a concept to screen book so we put it together like that and came up with a pretty substantial guide and then this was before eBay right before eBay and so I had to talk to a bunch of dealers and get an idea of what these things were worth. Of course, a price guide is uh, a price guide in print these days, or even even back in those days after the first couple of guides, is not worth it very much because prices change so dramatically. You know, people ask me what something is worth. I say go on eBay and see what something recently sold for. But it's it's really hard, and it was a matter of giving the best estimates that I could, I probably underpriced things. Uh, by the time the book came out, things had, had started taking off uh, and people were starting to put Star Wars items into their antique malls. And, um, and then QVC came along and started selling Star Wars items, new Star Wars collectibles on the air, which got everybody excited about the older stuff. And so it was going into a market that was just really starting up strong. It's interesting how many of the prices are still relevant. I know there's lots in there that have gone astronomical and it's completely out of date, but there was a lot of stuff in there where the prices have remained consistent. Well, that's true. I mean, you know, how many people are there that collect Star Wars sheets and pillowcases? <laughs> Children's underwear. <laughs> Children's underwear. Well, uh, yes. <laughs> There's some really uh, strange TV commercials for underoos that uh, you, you can still see on YouTube. And you think, oh, my God, they really aired those things? Uh, such are the days. I'm still, I'm, I'm always quite amazed at it. It's, it's, it is probably still my favorite Star Wars book ever. Okay, if I go on holiday, I always take the Tomahawk's Guide with me because I browse it and end up buying something off eBay that I come across in there. I still love it to these day, this day. But you think that's 26 years ago, and I, I don't know how long that a book like that takes to put together. There isn't much missing from it. I know things have been discovered, but it is, like you just said, a, it is quite a substantial and kind of bang on guide still. It's still very, very relevant, isn't it, with the items? Yes. I mean, on a lot of the items, on a lot of the vintage items, uh, because basically it's it's based on items that came out between 1977 and uh, 1985, 86 you know, plus um, some of the few items that came out during the dark years, like uh, the pewter chess set and things of that nature. But there wasn't a whole lot. And then, of course, we come to 1999 in episode one, and it's just like the amount of stuff doubled. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but, uh, but I was out of the price guide business by then. Yeah, probably a wise thing. I, I've also got Gus and Duncan's guide, which comes oh, that's a, that, that's and it's massive, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, yeah it's um, kind it of a, another stage of that. But um, but someone in someone in Britain who's obviously always 
discussed and sadly passed away recently is Jim Stevenson. I noticed that I think Dan noticed that he was acknowledged in the beginning of the book. Did what kind of role did he have in the Time Art Guide? Was he oh, your UK go to guy? Jim and I used to talk all the time. I mean, it, we we talked about the hobby, we talked about collecting, we talked about some stuff that things that he had found. And of course, Jim was an active seller. I mean, that's the way he made his livelihood. And he he came up, he turned up some amazing stuff. So I bought some things from Jim and we traded some things sometimes, but uh, it was just more of a a friendly relationship. And uh, he was a great guy. Uh, uh, Sorry to hear of his passing. What I loved when I when I wrote out your book list as well was your third book, which I have. And you know what? I'd, I'd never really, I don't think I've ever really looked at the cover. I didn't realise it was uh, on your list, and that was the, the, the joke book. I'd rather um, I'd just as soon kiss a Wookiee. Th- th- the, uh, like a, quote, the quote book. <laughs> yes, which yeah. which is brilliant, isn't it? It's um, just a complete different tangent, which I didn't see um, coming. How, how does how do you go from the Tomart's Garden concept to, to that? Well, I got approached by, uh, by someone at Random House. I had become friendly with uh, the Star Wars publishers. And uh, they said they wanted to put together a quick uh, quotables book and um, gave me an entire weekend to do it. <laughs> <laughs> right. So you. It, it took a little longer than the weekend, but uh, not much. I mean, I had the scripts in front of me and um, uh, went through it and organized it into the categories that you see in the book. Uh, they made some changes and uh, subtracted some things and added a few things, but basically it's the manuscript the way I turned it in after about a, a week of work. And of course, they didn't pay very much for that book. Unfortunately, it's it's still in print. Um, I must say, you can still get it on Amazon, can't you? I have seen it still on there, so it's... yeah. It's like sixth or seventh edition. And I noticed the price has crept up over the years, too. Um, But uh, no royalties on that. And uh, um, but it was a fun book to put together. And, um, you know, repeating, finding how many times I've got a bad feeling about that uh, appeared in the uh, appeared in the scripts and uh, what was said about Yoda or by Yoda. Uh, but it was a fun book to put together, so uh, I really enjoyed that. Um, we've never put a book out on the quotes from the uh, prequels or the sequels, um, so it's uh, it still remains the original trilogy uh, quotables book. I think it would work really well, actually, for the prequels. That's that's a, uh, a I think work these, do, yeah. I think these days it would. I think you know the given the benefit of time, uh, I think there are some things in there that um, you know this is how democracy dies. Um, there there probably are a bunch of quotes that we could get out and 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 make it a. Uh, it would be hard to do now and not include the sequels too. So you would have to come up with the scripts for all of those and and go through it and see what makes sense i think the basic the the basic book would still be by and far by and large the uh the original trilogy yeah. the best quotes yeah definitely i'm gonna hand over to dan for a minute because one of his favorite books i'm aware of is the scrapbook um dan i'm sure you've got i've got it in front of me as you actually signed this for me steve at, Cele- at celebration last year oh. yeah i gave you the the palatoid death star the uh the, the you know the the small cardboard version we Ooh, were we were that, handing out i love that piece so Mark Daniels is a host on it. He, he designed all of that and a group of us funded it. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So the, the, the scrapbook. So for me, it was the first the first Star Wars collecting book I bought. I missed the, the concept screen collectible. I picked that up later. But this was the first one that I got and really got me into collecting. So how, how did how did this book come about? Was this was this uh, was this your idea? Or was your approach for this one? Yeah, no, it was my idea to put together a book that actually had pieces that could be reproduced. We we did it later with the Star Wars vault. But this was an early version before any of the other vaults had come out, um, like the Superman vault and uh, the Marvel vault. And this was a spiral bound book with a hardcover, but with inserts of, you know, we had uh, an action figure card and just big photos of things that potentially could be cut out if you wanted to. and uh, it was a lot of fun just finding objects from the collection because this was more of a flat object 
ephemera kind of thing. And I, God knows I've got hundreds of boxes filled with uh, Star Wars ephemera from early fan uh, and uh, dealer price lists going back to the uh, to the original movie and uh, newspaper ads and all kinds of clippings and catalogs and invitation cards and everything a collector might be interested in. You got the sticker sheets in there. So you got a Japanese couple. I think there's a couple of sets in there. Is that was how? How did you go about getting those in the book? Did you have to go and get permission to use them, or, or were they well, owned by Lucasfilm? Just- this was all of my Star Wars books were done under the imprimatur of Lucasfilm. Right. And so um, uh, they either uh, asked me if I'd be interested in doing a book or I would come to them. And, and these books were done. I joined Lucasfilm in 96. Um, so some of these books were done before I was a, a member of Lucasfilm and some of them were done afterwards. Um, but uh so I, I didn't have any concerns about rights on any of the objects that we could use. We could use photos and reproductions. And I mean, that was the great thing about uh, the, the books being official Lucasfilm publications. It, it would make contract negotiations a little more difficult mm. but uh, because the royalties needed to be shared. Obviously, Lucasfilm got a a hefty royalty on the publication of a book about Star Wars, and the author needed to get some money too. I I I did very well, so I can't complain at all, uh, ex- except for the uh, quotable book. But uh, that was that was strictly a buyout. And these days, authors frequently do not get royalties on books. It's the uh, the way the book publishing business has gone. You know, unless you're a best-selling nonfiction uh, fiction writer. Uh, and you can name your own price, basically, and that's where the big contracts are. There's not a whole lot of money in writing books like this, but um, but at least I didn't have to worry about getting clearances and um, uh, getting the the help of Lucasfilm in doing a lot of this stuff. It's a great book, though. I, I'm still picking up things from it today. I got the uh, An Empire Strikes Back coaster recently for the cast and crew so yeah okay. oh those are it's, great and the yeah. uh, pass the passport and um on on the set passport that you got that gary kurtz came up with to visit the set of the empire strikes back and then there were rubber stamps that uh, that they used uh, for some of the guests Just fun stuff yeah and i've got the, the peanut butter uh, the peanut butter caps from canada as well is it um, York peanut butter? I picked those up oh, recently yeah. as well. Oh, Just yeah. go around always sticking this stuff off. <laughs> well, the food items are a whole specialty for a lot of people, and I love the food items because th- that's one of the things that people don't think of very much and that gets thrown away. But uh, uh, Gus Lopez is the cereal king. I've got hundreds of cereal boxes, but Gus makes a, a point every time a new movie comes out or a TV show – he has agents in 30 countries who look out for him, and, and, and it has to be every size and every variation. And he's got one of the rooms at the Boba Cabana in Seattle is a, a cereal room, and uh, it, it's amazing stuff. But there's so much more. There's, um, there's uh, drinks. There's... Um, um, candy there's chips and there's all kinds of uh uh little products that go in the chip bags or in the cereal boxes mm-hmm. and so it's a it's a huge collecting area on its own brilliant his um his cereal display is actually quite a sight to behold isn't it after <laughs> it is pretty amazing because he has i mean all my boxes are flattened but he has several hundred boxes that are actually made uh, I mean, the cereal is out, although at one of the celebrations in the uh, at the archive party, somebody had some actual uh, C-3PO cereal from 1984. And six guys were six guys, maybe one woman were brave enough or stupid enough to agree to a contest. So it was who could eat a bowl of C-3PO's quickest from 1984. And you had your choice of with milk or without milk. <laughs> Lovely. And they all finished them. They said they weren't that bad. They tasted the same as they did in 1984. Cardboardy. <laughs> oh. <laughs> 
some bad bellies the next day, I bet. Uh, oh, yeah, I wouldn't want to ask. You, you've released so many great books over the years. I, I love the poster book you did with Pete, uh, Pete Vilmore. Oh, it's um, one of my favorites. Pete and it, I really had fun it, doing that book. It is a beautiful book. Obviously, The Vault is, a, is an amazing piece of work. The encyclopedias are lovely. and But I want to come right, right up to date to your last book, which was The Ultimate Action Figure Collection. I know this is another one that Dan absolutely adores. That is a great, great book. How, how long do you work on a book like that? Because how many figures are in it? 2,300 or something, is it? Yes, 20, <laughs> 2,300 figures. And of course, God knows how many more there are <laughs> since then. Uh, that book took uh, a good nine months of work. And um, Ann Newman, who is the vice president and curator of Rancho Obi-Wan, was uh my uh, my compatriot in putting that book together, and she did a lot of the photography. Uh, we also used uh, the uh, Jedi Archives photography. Those guys were wonderful. And uh, Dan Curto provided a lot. Of, you know, we had a bunch of people working on that. We have some wonderful pictures of Anne. Who we needed photos of the figures off the cards, and so... I've always bought two or three, or I've tried to get two or three of each figure um, on a card and had not taken them off a card for many, many years. And uh, well, we got all the dupes and just we have a picture of Anne on the floor lying on top of a pile of maybe hundreds of ripped cards and bubbles and <laughs> she has she and, a, and some other friends have helped to take the figures off catalog them put them in uh little plastic bags with uh, numbers on them so we can find them and then we put them in uh in little cardboard bins in alphabetical order you know sometimes if it was darth vader uh, there'd be two and a half bins filled with just variations of the darth vader figure how many darth vader figures can you come up with he doesn't change the way he looks well more than you think the most figures can you guess which character had the most figures the clone troopers no i no? mean as far as a single character okay. Luke skywalker right and you wouldn't think that luke <laughs> I mean, Luke uh, obviously is an important character in the saga, but Luke Skywalker having the most figures? And, of course, that would be even more so now with the sequels. But uh, but I was amazed. I mean, that would have been... Darth Vader is a very close second. But there are some... Nine, there were... When the book came out, there were some 90 figures of Luke Skywalker, of course, with the floppy hat, without, in all the three movies. Um and Darth Vader, there was a Darth Vader with uh, no removable mask and helmet, removable helmet only, removable mask and helmet, removable part of a mask. <laughs> it was just crazy. And then there were the comic book versions where it been and the Christmas versions. I think that was the worst. The poorest selling uh, Kenner Hasbro figure of all time was the... Uh, was the shiny red Darth Vader for Christmas one year. I've got to be honest with you, Steve. If there's a book that's crying out for an update, it is that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you don't somebody, fancy that, though. Well, no. Somebody's doing a, a, a book. Um, Dave Myatt and um, some partners are doing a book on the vintage collection that I've written an introduction to. Um, and uh, I think that's going to be a marvelous book. So it'll be all of the the vintage collection line of figures through the through the years. Uh, so that that's going to be a beautiful book, and that's going to go back to um, more like the uh, the first action figure book that had the figures carded and uncarded, and the um, toys that that came with the figures, or the figures that came with the toys, and and the actual uh, vehicles and things of that nature. I mean, that's what I really wanted to do with this book, but it just got so big and just on the figures, just on the, the clone trooper figures, my God, so many clone trooper figures and figuring out what the variations were and how this differed from that. And the stormtroopers or the clone troopers with, uh, with uh, four bullet holes, three bullet holes, two bullet holes, which one was the accident, which one was meant to be that way. Uh, oh. 
drove <laughs> me crazy. Drove Ant crazy too. It is amazing. I think there's like twenty odd pages. I think of just clone troopers. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then we had to figure out the alphabetizing, and then at the last, and everything. There were so many figures per page, and so I wanted if I wanted to sub a figure or I wanted to add something, then I had to figure out something to take out and or figure out how it could be put in the book in the page format. It was a very unforgiving page format, and so it was really tricky coming up with the uh, the changes in that. Uh, and then at the last minute, the publisher said, "Well, we want Job of the Hut," and I said, "Well, he's not an action figure, but he sort of is." So we had to add the the Jabba's, oh, crazy book, crazy book. And then they said they wanted it delivered, how the photos were to be delivered uh, with all the caption information as part of the metadata of the photo. And I I don't know what you're talking about, but eventually I lost that argument and figured out how to put the captions in the metadata of the photos. Oh, man. You're bringing back nightmares, guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, when that book came out, it was, I think it was November 2012, so it was literally a week or two after Lucas sold Disney. Was it? Did it kind of feel fitting that, that, that you'd made that book at that time because it kind of drew a line under kind of the Lucas era yes, of action I figures? I thought of it that way, but yes, you're, you're very right. Yeah, that was uh, quite a uh, shocking announcement, but in retrospect, not a real surprise. No. It's another book that's really stood the test of time, though. It's another book that it's great to pick up and have a browse and uh, a look, and it, it is so well laid out. If if you weren't there in the sausage factory when it was made, yes, it's a lovely book. Yeah, <laughs> you don't you don't look back at that one fondly then. <laughs> it was a lot of work and a lot um, of aggravation, but I'm glad I'm glad it t- turned out the way it did. I'm very happy with it. That book was your last in in that line back in 2012. So 20 years of books. I'm aware that you've uh, I bought in Chicago last year your Treasures of Rancho Obi Wan, uh, right. the fan book, which, which is which is really nice. It's a really a real different type of book from these big kind of guide books and these big kind of encyclopedias. Have you retired from that now? Is is that done? Pretty much so. Uh, we're spending a lot of time and energy on the virtual museum, and so I do a lot of videos for that. And sometimes the videos last 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, a weekend ago, we did two um, uh, Facebook Live uh, stream tours of what we would have brought to Star Wars Celebration if it had gone off this year in celebration of the 40th anniversary of The Empire Strikes Back. So that was a lot of fun, but it took a lot of uh, a lot of effort to put that together. You can still see those if you go to RanchoObiWan.org, and they're in two parts, and so they're about an hour each, and we show a lot of the wonderful items from The Empire Strikes Back, and that's uh, that's free to watch. So um, right now, uh, no books uh, in the near term. You never know. You never know. If somebody came to me tomorrow, a publisher, and said, I want to update the Quotables book, I would do it in a flash. <laughs> but um, another action figure book? Uh, no, I've written th- introductions to three books in the last few months, and I think the introductions are doable and uh, not so time-consuming, and I have fun writing them, so I'm, I'm keeping my hand in the writing, but... Uh, as far as another big book, uh, I, I think I've retired from that. Seventeen books, guys. That's enough. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> yeah, and you've uh, and that, they really are they really are superb. One question that one of the one of our podcast people we work with asked. He, he said, with all of the knowledge, data, and imagery of you you've amassed creating these books, you're pretty well placed to actually create an online resource that could probably blow the SWCA out of the water in terms of design and accessibility. Is this something that's ever been considered, discussed, or um, or would it be treading on too many toes? And Yes, we're working on one. Oh. We're working on a Ooh. database that will become part of the virtual museum. And so that's in our plans, and that's something that's uh, in the, the early stages. And uh, I'm confident that it will that it will happen as you said we have to be uh cognizant of all the legal ramifications but photos of objects that are in your collection are uh fair game um so uh i don't think that'll be much of a problem and we work well with lucasfilm i'm still you know sort of in general a a part of that vast community 
although I no longer work for them and I no longer consult for them. But uh, Rancho Obi-Wan is, uh, is an approved museum as far as Lucasfilm's concerned. They've used us a lot, and Disney has too. So uh, we have great relations with the folks there. That's brilliant and really exciting news, you know. Uh, it won't happen tomorrow, but, uh, <laughs> but it, it, is, it is in our planning. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. Something to definitely uh, excite for the future. Steve, thank you so much for taking your time with us. I'm, I know as far as I'm concerned and, and most of the people I, I speak with in the hobby, you define the hobby and you've influenced a major part of all our lives. You know, would we all be in this hobby without some of this literature and without what you share? Probably not. So your impact on, on all of us as collectors is is so, so important. And um, we do really do thank you for uh, Definitely. all Definitely. your way. Well, thank you both, Stuart and Dan. It's been a pleasure uh, chatting with you. And uh, bringing up some memories for me too yeah some 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 good ones along with the bad ones <laughs> yeah <laughs> finished on the downer <laughs> um, no steve thank you so much we really do appreciate it my pleasure guys cheers take care so there you go dan concept of screen to collectible quite interesting to delve into that wasn't it the tome arts guide i just assumed kiss a wookie which i didn't realize he had written until uh, about four hours ago i thought he's going to start cracking some of the jokes out of it yeah i thought it was a joke book i have got it somewhere but then he went no it's a quote book <laughs> i was like oh. but hey i think my favorite quote from the prequels is sand it gets everywhere that's quite a funny line i hate sand <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah he said he sounded like he was up for writing that book didn't he, he was um, yeah it was good good fun yeah it was good fun and uh great to chat with him and obviously listeners you you heard at the beginning about rancho obi-wan obviously they're struggling not being open so if anyone wants to get involved in the virtual tours or go and support rancho obi-wan head over to rancho obi-wan.org as steve said if you have any feedback, you can email us at generationskywalker at gmail.com. You can check out our social media, Instagram, Twitter and Facebook. Just search for Generation Skywalker. Go and check out the enhanced versions over on YouTube. Again, search Generation Skywalker. Craig's doing a great job. You know, we're smashing out shows this month and he's smashing out those enhanced versions pretty quickly after we finish the edit. So um, he's, uh, he's working his little bottom off. Bless him. You can go to www.generationskywalker.com where you will find blogs and links to all the shows and the videos. Just before we go, Dan, what's your favourite sound sweet book? Scrap book. <laughs> <laughs> what's yours? Um, that's a good question. Uh, the Tomart Tomart Guide. The Tomart Guide, because I do really enjoy it. But I do really enjoy the Ultimate Action Figure Collection as well. Yeah. But um, Dan, thank you for joining me. No worries. I'll speak with you very, very soon. 